their way of thinking. Mm -hmm. And it can be awkward initially. And well, because we know the old scripting. And, and this is calling for something new and unfamiliar. And there aren't a whole lot of role models for, for the new way of being. So it feels like very uncharted water sometimes. I had that experience at a funeral. I, you know, last summer when my friend Tom died of AIDS, and you know, it had been like a two-year time that I'd spent with him in this illness, and, and um, just coming to such clarity with him about he was not his body, he was not he did not have AIDS to me. I mean, I just did not see him that way at all. And um, and when he died, I just, I immediately went to the course and looked up everything it said about death and um, found all these wonderful passages that were just such a comfort to me and just spent a lot of quiet time and a lot of time praying. and. Um, and felt from his, his presence with me. I mean, it was just like he was, I, I mean, I even felt him like over my shoulder. I, and I was talking to him, and I just felt like he was right there with me. And I was saying, Tom, what was it you were trying to teach me? And, and it was like flashes were coming to me. And, oh my gosh, that was it, that was it. And it was like one right after another, all these insights that, of things that, Tom was trying to, to teach me through this process that I had known him in. And, and I had this, this feeling of him, you know, just smiling and laughing and going, Good, you got it! Finally! Yeah! You know? <laughs> and I mean, I was just so joyful. And I went to, and I even, I thought, well, am I to go to his funeral or not? Because I didn't feel like I had anything incomplete with him. You know, we had talked you know, days before he had died, and I felt real complete, and I had told him everything I felt about him, and he had told me, and it was like there was nothing more left unsaid. And so, but but I felt, you know, I was to go, and I went, and I have, my experience of funerals in the past has always been, once I start crying, I cannot stop. I mean, it's just like a flood of tears and I just feel intense grief. Um, and I didn't, I didn't shed a tear. And I had several people around me who were real close friends of mine who, again, that's another thing that I've always, like if there's somebody I'm close, that I perceive myself as close to if they're crying, it's like just an automatic trigger to me that I just go into it too. But, and this one friend of mine was just, sobbing and sobbing and sobbing through the whole thing and I just felt like I you know I could hold her and I could be with her and everything but it just didn't it just didn't feel like it always had before it felt different and um, just throughout the whole thing and then we drove to the cemetery and had the you know, the ceremony there and everything. It was just all of it together. It was just like, I just had this feeling of him being right there with me and saying, it's okay, it's okay, I'm fine. Nothing happened. <laughs> you know? And it was just, it was such an incredibly different experience for me. And I was so grateful for that, just to see that it doesn't have to be perceived that's this tragic thing. It was amazing. And it's, again, not to, to project your feelings or say, mm -hmm. I, you know, to deny things and no. whatever, but that's no. why we're here today is in anything we go into, if things trigger or whatever, and, and you want to process or you want to trace them back, that's what the that's what the is all about. It's really starting to trace it back and see the meaninglessness of it. When the meaninglessness isn't seen, then it can seem like a sad picture, or, or there can be all kinds of emotions. 
shreds of fear, grief, and and so on and so forth, and pain and sadness and all those kind of things. And and the course of simple teaching is is whenever you're not feeling happy, peaceful, or joyful, it's a misperception, and you you have another choice. There's early on in the text where Jesus will go through about sadness and depression and um, all these different things, and the, the, I think the name of the section is "This Need Not Be." <laughs> he goes through, he goes through one at a time these these emotions that seem to be devastating, and then this need not be depression. Depression comes when you are deprived of something that you want but do not have. Remember, you are deprived of nothing except by your own decision, and then. Decide otherwise. <laughs> very, very, you know, it doesn't avoid things, just kind of traces it through and really traces it, talks about it always as a decision. It, on the surface, it doesn't seem like a decision. It seems like there can be waves of emotion, sometimes without even a specific reference. At times, the emotion seems to be tied into a specific event that's being perceived or a specific memory that's being, you know, brought up into awareness. But at times it seems to be very general, you know, like sometimes when people have like chronic depression and you say, well, what are you, what are you thinking about? It's like, I just, I don't know, but I don't feel like life is worth living, you know, there's not even a, a real sense of what the, what the uh, specific connections are, or there's hard, it's very difficult at times to even have a starting point, just in those kind of cases, but in every case, Jesus is saying it's always a misperception and there's always it's always a decision that you're deciding for that particular emotion. I thought today, I know the other day, it's always helpful to go through the metaphysics and I the other day I told you the, the little instead of the Adam and Eve story, I told you that in the beginning we're all as one, there crept a tiny mad idea at which the Son of God remembered not to laugh. There's another passage in the course that really starts to describe the fall in very graphic terms and I think it can be helpful because it just doesn't, you know, most people don't spend their days giving a conscious thought to the fall of man. I mean there just seems to be so many specific problems, job related problems, relationship problems, financial problems, these things, they seem so concrete, they seem so real, they seem like they take so much energy to deal with that most people do not think about the fall of man <laughs> when they wake up in the morning. And passages like these, are, to me, are really helpful because that's the problem. The problem is the belief in separation. And no matter how far removed, no matter how far the mind seems to have gone into this maze, and there's layers and layers of complexity that seem to make the fall an obscurity, then really it's just that one problem we talked about. So there's a passage that, uh, when it's talking about the two emotions on page um, 347, that, that really starts to um, talk about the fall and basically I was just going to say that's chapter 18. Are we going to be in the first section? The yeah. substitute reality? Mm -hmm. The substitute reality. Would you like to use the book on that? No, I have fine. an extra one. Thank you. I've got one in the car. I just didn't bring it in because we really didn't use it the other day. It's okay. And this time, looking at the fall, instead of a tiny mad idea at which the son remembered not to laugh, this time it's, it's coming at the fall in terms of substitution. And I think substitution is an interesting kind of thing in the sense that there's truth and there's illusion. And it's kind of like, you know, when they talk about babies being switched at birth, but in a sense there's a substitution, or there's a switch that's taken place. That the mind, when it fell asleep, it just, it switched. It, it took serious this, this thing called illusion and it forgot reality. So really that's the first and the only substitution that has ever taken place was the substitution of truth for illusion, or illusion, actually illusion for truth is the first substitution. And the mind was so horrified that it started making all kinds of substitutions and adjustments to try to handle the first one without dealing with the original one. 
it's just started making up things. It's kind of like when a child does something and he thinks it's terrible. He thinks, oh my gosh, if my mom and dad ever found out about this. And so he tells a lie and then tries to cover he tries to cover it and then he starts telling another one and another one and another one. And it seems to him like, I, I can't let mom and dad find out about the first thing. That's too horrendous. So I'll, if I have to tell 15 lies, if I have to, to weave a web around it and to really make it obscure, then that'll be good, because then mom and dad probably won't ever find out about it. You know, it'll take a real sleuth to get back to that. So, or you've seen those movies where, you know, people seem to be wanting to help each other. We watched one last night, as a matter of fact, where there, one lie starts and then more and more, and it's just pretty soon you have the web of deceit. Or um, I think of movies like um, Dustin Hoffman, Jessica Lange, Tootsie, you know, where he really likes the Dustin Hoffman character really likes her, and he wants to, he needs a job, and so he that's his that's his first thing is to to get the job. He he goes into deception right away, and he dresses up like a woman. Then he seems to fall in love, and and Jessica Lange character really confides in him, female to female, you know, so to speak, and really trusts you know trust that character, and then he falls in love, and then it's like, now what am I going to do? You know, <laughs> like, all the people, I remember on the soap opera that he's on, when he finally, you know, goes off the script and takes off his wig and everything, and all these people are, ah! <laughs> There's this big lie, and all these substitutions have taken place. And those are all just good metaphors for precisely what the mind has done in this world, and for each one of us to take a good look at it. And am I going to continue to keep adjusting Am I going to continue to keep substituting? We've, we've substituted bodies, families, cars, homes, jobs. We've substituted travel. We've substituted pleasures, conveniences, comforts. Oh, it's just a web of, of things to try to, to make up a kingdom and, and to kind of forget about that first substitution. And Jesus is saying, it ain't going to work. Substitute all you want. Come back here. Come back with me and let's look at the first one, and the only one, and then you'll be free. You'll be, you'll remember who you are. Like it kind of gets back, Dave, to then where you were saying, but it ain't so bad. So what we want to do then is take, well, let me just take a few of these lies. Yes. They work, they seem to work, and they seem to be kind of fun. Yes. So we'll take a few of these lies and we'll use this to get rid of the rest. Yes. You know, and that's where a lot of conflict comes in. Yes. Just, just when you start looking at them, mm -hmm. It, it seems to be conflict because the substitutions have seemed to work and now the mind is being taught that they really haven't worked. Mm -hmm. and, and to me the word adjustment is important too. It's like when that first substitution was made the mind has followed it with a series of adjustments. I remember when I was in college taking a, a, the psychology of adjustment, you know, and really just questioning the underpinnings like something fishy about it. Adjustment, I just didn't like that word. I just, there was something that adjustment meant and coping mechanisms. Why cope? Why not go to the source and be free forever? Why just cope, 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 and this and that? <laughs> I remember when I worked at Goodwill, I worked in work adjustment. I was a work adjustment supervisor, and most of the work that we were supposed to be doing was helping these mentally retarded, schizophrenic, uh, adults with many, many seeming different disabilities, physical, emotional, mental, psychological, adjust to work, you know, adjust, become productive citizens, build their productivity, learn work skills and everything. And their, the clients were coming to me, you know, they, they were, they had issues with their supervisors and productivity and this and that and pay and all this and that, but they had issues, a lot of mental issues they want to talk about, you know, relationships with their families and so on and so forth, and I remember the program I was working in, it was kind of like they were one, they wanted us all to use a behavior modification approach to work adjustment. And I remember at the time, I just came across the course, and I had all my progressive ideas, and it felt like doing all this behavior mod was like working with one hand, kind of tied behind your back, saying, here, come on in my office and let's talk for a minute, see if we can, you know, get down to something a little bit deeper than just, you know, how many chips did you get in your work adjustment, you know, 
charting and all this and that. 